I know it's hard, I know it sucks, but there's a better future out there. And even if it's really hard to see right now, you've got to keep fighting for it. You have got to keep pushing. I understand, right, the desire to give up. I really do. I totally understand. I understand that feeling of being in the abyss, of it being hard to move, like your body feels like lead some days. It's hard to do the dishes. It's hard to take out the trash. It's hard to take a shower. Believe me, I promise I know. If you can't find a way to help yourself, then try to find someone else who can support you. Anyone, anyone who you think can be a link, anyone who you think can help build you up financial support emotional support a therapist it does not matter find somebody who can help you start to make a change in your life welcome to stronger than you think a podcast by youth villages i'm your host alec Og. in each episode you'll hear a story of resilience from a former foster youth they've overcome unimaginably difficult circumstances and they'll also share a mental health practice that helped them to persevere You'll also be hearing from mental health professionals who work at Youth Villages. They'll add some clinical perspective on how you can incorporate these mental health tools into your own life so that you can be stronger than you think. Our guests today are twin brothers, Jordan and Devin. We'll be discussing how an exercise where you envision your ideal self changed their lives. You'll also be hearing from Becky Smith. My name is Becky Smith, and I am our clinical services director of our residential programs. Becky's worked at Youth Villages for 21 years. There's a philosophy that we have at Youth Villages of kids will do well if they can. And so we we talk about it's more skill than a will thing. And I think our society feels like kids are willfully bad, misbehaving willfully causing problems and we don't really believe that at youth villages we really believe that kids are engaging in challenging behavior because they don't have the skills to do better and so for us it's how do we give them the skills we'll hear more from becky later in the episode but before we get into jordan and devin's story i want to give a quick content warning that this episode contains references that may be triggering and difficult to hear this includes references and allusions to suicide and mental illness This trigger warning is to empower you as the listener to make a healthy decision about if, when, and how you should consume this episode. If you need support, please look at the links for resources we've listed in the show notes. But now, let's get into Jordan and Devin's story. My name is Jordan Brown. And my name is Devin Brown. I am the other twin here. Jordan and Devin grew up in Duck Creek, Missouri. You can try to find it on a map. I'd almost consider it a challenge. It... It's not a town. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's a it's a geographic location. It is definitely the middle of nowhere. It, Duck Creek is my proof that marshes still exist in America. <laughs> <laughs> what feels like a beginning or a starting point for you all? To me, honestly, it feels like the beginning was with foster care. No, let's actually, let's go a little bit further back than that. I'd say the beginning was when I first hit a point where I had authorities involved in our lives at all. And, you know, that would be at a point where we were kind of living in a rundown duplex. We're talking like four people sleeping in one room. It only had like one, maybe two bedrooms in the living room, but there were five people living there. No, no, there were six actually. Yeah, me, you, mom, dad, and cousin. And little sister, seven. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was seven people living in that place. So there was only one exit, so it broke the fire rules. Um, There was literally mushrooms growing in the kitchen. There was sewage out in the front yard. Mold, definitely. The yeah. place was filthy. It was never clean. It's been um, a long time, so it can be hard to remember. But I actually, thinking back to it, we were sick a lot. Like, every month, there was something new. We'd be going to the doctor to get checked up for. And, you know, they'd tell us it was allergies, but... We'd be getting checked up for strep throat. I had bronchitis a few times. The place was always damp and smelly. Outside, you couldn't step out the front door without smelling sewage. Sometimes we'd have to check the water um, to make sure that it wasn't unclean. Like, I remember that sometimes the water would come out and be like, yo, it's like, whoa, 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 we we can't drink this. (laughs) So I got to like, I I can't touch it. I'll, uh, I'll take a can of soda. Yeah, that's healthier. The sounds that I would describe? Arguing. Lots and lots of arguing. you got a small space. You've got a lot of people. Probably just about everyone in the building is not properly emotionally stable for one reason or another. You know, you've got one very destructive child who wants to rip up everything he's got. You've got one very young girl who is still a, practically a baby. And then you've got two parents who constantly fight. And then you have another adult, an aunt. She was the most stable adult in the household. Um, Definitely our favorite. In fact, we still keep in regular touch with her today. But uh, it's like 
She was the sane mind in a world of chaos. It didn't go too well together. I, I, I kind of hate to call it out like this, but I distinctly remember a conversation with my mother when I was 12, right? And I told her I was depressed, and she told me, you don't even know what that word means. And I gave her the textbook definition. <laughs> it is a feeling of defeat and hopelessness. And that is how I feel. And at the time, I don't think she took me seriously. Maybe she just didn't feel like she had the resources to get help. She's apologized for that since then, but, you know, it's like, I, I want to make the comment here that if your first ask for help, you know, people don't take you seriously, you know, you do have to find someone who will, because if you get told no and you give up, then that's it. You, you don't get the help you need, and you've got to find someone who will help you get the help you need. At that point, um, you know, I was hitting a pretty bad low in school and my grades were suffering. I was at a point where everyone always said, you know, you got to talk to somebody. So I thought I'm going to I'm going to talk to someone because that's what they say to do. And everyone wants to know why I'm breaking down all the time and, you know, why I can't focus on my work, why I'm always tired. I've, I got to I got to say something. It's like you don't want to change things because you're always afraid that change will make the situation worse. But it got to a point where even if things had to change, we thought the current situation was so bad that we didn't have a choice. I was sitting in the classroom with the teacher talking and I just wasn't there. Like, I, I imagine I would be sitting there just staring, just sitting there thinking, I don't care. This does not matter. None of this matters. It's all pointless. Nothing is gonna go anywhere anyway. I'm not gonna go to college. Uh, I can't do this. I don't wanna be here. I don't wanna be anywhere. It's like, you're not even wanting to try anymore. It's, it's more like every single thing that you're supposed to do, even getting out of bed, trying to brush your teeth, trying to take a shower, every single little thing you do, you just ask yourself first, what's the point? That's the question that comes before every single action you take. And for me, in, in that moment, I probably decided that, you know, if nothing else, what's the worst that can happen? I get out of this classroom for 10 minutes. You know, I get to go sit somewhere else alone, away from everybody and have some peace. Yeah, why not? Let's go talk. And eventually I spoke to the counselor and I started explaining to her my situation. This got the, some authorities involved, and eventually they decided, hey, this home does not meet the safe living standards. Um, we're actually going to have to get you out of there and relocate you. So then we ended up in foster care. And we were in foster care, I kept very close count, for four days short of two months. And that's not a very long time, but that's because uh, as soon as we got into foster care, I decided within about a week that we were not going to stay in foster care. I kind of worked pretty actively to get us out of it. I'm going to be blunt. Um, they were not good caretakers. Um, they pretty much wanted nothing to do with us. Uh, I very much felt like they were only there to grab a check. Their home was poverty red, and I couldn't believe that they were even eligible to be foster care guardians. It's like there was some kind of effort made, but we didn't feel like we belonged there. But that part itself was really bad. Our argument for getting out of foster care was essentially if you don't pull us out of foster care, there's going to be a permanent solution and you're not going to stop it. It was... we couldn't do it anymore. And you guys vocalized that? We vocalized yes, it I, heavily. It was more like a, it was more like a, a threat that I... Um, I wouldn't want to go into details on it, right. but I was very persuasive with the threat. Yeah. And we got help, but it was frustrating that we had to... It's frustrating to have to put yourself so close into serious danger for somebody to take you seriously and listen to what you're saying. So where do you go after foster care? We go back to living with our aunt, who had now picked up a trailer. Um, again, she was still on her own, so other adults are no longer in the and, picture here. And this is going to be the theme with our aunt. I, I want to say very clearly that she is possibly the hardest working, most honest, good-natured person I've ever met in my life. She doesn't wish harm on anybody, and she did everything she could to try to be like, you know, she's not biologically our mom, but she would always say, no, you're my kids. As far as I'm concerned, I am your mother. So where are you guys academically at this point? It was a long-held belief that, honestly, for a while, I wasn't sure I would graduate high school. Um, but my aunt kind of begged me, please finish high school. And I actually am going to have to give some credit to Jordan here. I consider Jordan the stronger of us two, by the way. Um, I'll say that now. But it would be like, Jordan was going to finish high school. So I'm like, well, Jordan's going to finish high school. I guess I should, too. Our, our parents have GEDs, but they got them 
at a later date. They didn't finish high school with a diploma. So we, we kind of, we didn't believe that like achieving that kind of life was possible because of our starting position. Yes. You know, we did not believe in class mobility. We believed you're born poor, you're going to stay poor. I, I remember, it wasn't our dream at the time in high school. We were like 14. Our ideal life, the best we thought we could achieve was we were going to graduate high school and then we were going to work at GameStop. Yeah, we were going to work at GameStop and share a small apartment together. And that was it. That was the peak of what our life would be. So what made you realize that life could be bigger than a small apartment and GameStop? We had just recently started attending this church. We are atheists. Um, this was at a time where we were kind of still exploring the idea. And if nothing else, we just wanted to give it a try. Um, the pastor there, Matt, and his wife, Rita, while we were in foster care, you know, they heard about how unhappy we were. And they said, well, you know, why don't you come and stay the weekend at our place? And we didn't really know them. We were strangers to each other. But they offered for me and Jordan to come and stay with them. And we took them up on it. They were middle class. We had always lived in poverty. And I'm never going to forget walking into their house, honestly. Oh. Uh, like walking in and being like, wow, this place is nice. Wow, this place is clean. Wow, I can't smell anything in here. There's no smell of mold. There's no dampness. There's no filth. It's just nice. And I, I remember just looking at the couches and the beds like, man, I just want to sit on them and just, you know, chill and, and not worry. And they had these TVs and this high speed internet and all this really nice clean food. They would take us out to eat. Um, they weren't worried about the money at all. You know, that was a really crazy thing for us. It's like, uh, what do you mean? We can't go out to eat. That costs money. It's like, what? Dairy Queen? It's like eight bucks for a box of chicken strips. How can you afford that? sight into what a middle class life looks like a life where you're not living paycheck to paycheck yeah we looked at that and we're like yeah i want this life this is the one i want i don't want that old life that we had the entire time we growing up i'm you know we saw this group of people where this is what it's like to be successful and safe and secure and you know financially uh what's the word i'm looking for here maybe respectable because uh, we wouldn't say financially stable to us financially stable is being able to pay your bills they were well beyond that. Yes, yeah, like their bills aren't even on the mind. It's like, oh, bills, oh, that's paid for. Don't even worry about it. We we have all this extra money we can do stuff with. It's like, you know, they, they have their own garden they take care of. And, you know, they invited us over for Christmas and stuff too. Um, they were just, they were wonderful people. And to this day, I have incredible respect for those two. I even, haven't spoken. Even though we disagree with them, you know, because we are atheists and they're, they're a pastor and a wife, so they're obviously very religious. We disagree on that front, but I will always be grateful for the things that they did for us. It was around this time when the twins got connected with Youth Villages. Who was that group in high school? I'm having trouble remembering it. Uh, Intercept? Intercept? Intercept. Life Intercept. That is that is how we got into the YV program. That was a result of not necessarily foster care. <laughs> um, you know, I've already alluded to mental health issues. YV Intercept was a result of that program. And that was probably the first time where, you know, aside from our aunt, I felt like I was getting some sincere support. There was an effort made to try to set up um, some kind of therapy. Or and, it, and it wasn't just therapy like at the school. This wasn't guidance anymore. When he got the attention of the Intercept program, they actually sent someone out to our home to meet with us on a regular basis. It was a very closely guided session. I want to I want to call that out right there, by the way. The concept of saying, don't, hey, let's come to my office and talk about this. It's like, you know, when, when you're at a point where you need that kind of help, maybe you don't even have the motivation to go out. Maybe you don't have the transportation. It is so much more helpful for someone to come to you and, you know, to talk to you. So that was wonderful. And it was the first time that... This person who was coming into our home, I mean, first off, you know, she's by herself. She's coming out to a stranger's house to sit in there and talk with them for an hour. And she really cared. The entire time I've interacted with Youth Villages, I have believed for every second of it that Youth Villages really cared, that the Live Set program really cared about us. Pretty much every positive event I can think of over the last five years can be traced back to Youth Villages. So um, it's, it's like there, there's no amount of praise we can give to Youth Villages and the impact of life set on our lives and our development as adults that could overstate their contributions. It's not possible. At this point, Youth Villages appointed a designated life set specialist named Carrie Mayfield to the twins. She began encouraging them to consider college. And then uh, Carrie Mayfield comes in. It's like, you guys should do college. And I'm like, I don't, 
I don't really know if I if I can do well, college. We had so many things. We're like, did you see our grades in high school? I mean, we have no money. We have no transportation. We don't know anything about applying to college. We don't know how to get housing. We don't have any kind of insurance. We don't know anything about... We, we didn't know anything about the world. It's like, well, we'll go to the University of Memphis. They have scholarships. I mean, and, you know, they're not super expensive. They're, they're a cheap university. And we're like, well, I don't know anything about Memphis. Um, you know, I thought about it and I was like... You know, the idea of living in Memphis with just the two of us not being around our family sounded scary because we didn't know anything. But then we thought about it and we were like, but if we lived by ourselves and we weren't around our family, then we wouldn't have to deal with the screaming and the fighting all the time. You know, we wouldn't have to deal with how filthy everything was. The other thing was we really wanted to try the city life. Um, while we were in high school, we attended a, an orientation at the University of Memphis. Um, we spent one weekend at the University of Memphis and we agreed and in there. Yeah, we, 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 this look, is exciting. Look at all of this stuff in the city, man. I, there's so many places to eat. I, was just, I just remember looking at all the different restaurants and being like, how do you even decide where you want to go? Like, even if you have the money to go to a restaurant or eat fast food, how do you pick a place? There's so many choices. It was, it was really interesting coming it, to the no, city. I don't want to say interesting. Magical is how I would describe it. And I mean, like, all the way the buildings were done, you know, they looked so much more solid and there wasn't uh, so many insects running around. Like, everything just felt cleaner and more organized. I'm not saying there's no mosquitoes in Memphis, but I can go outside for a couple hours after 8 p.m. and I'm not going to walk in and wake up in the morning with, like, 30 mosquito bites every day. With this newfound enthusiasm for the University of Memphis, Carrie Mayfield, their life set specialist, introduced them to yet another Youth Villages program. She offered me the idea of applying to be a YV scholar. And I asked her what the benefits were. And the more she talked about it, the more I listened to it. And I was like, well, these things all sound great, but I don't understand why anybody would do this for me. Yeah, I mean, she's talking about having support. Um, she's talking about having a mentor, uh, having a, a stipend to help you, uh, you know, having our college paid for scholarships as long as you maintain good grades. And the whole time she's talking about it, I'm just sitting there like, there's so much, there's so many benefits. I'm like, why, why would I be worth it? It's like, hey, what branch of the government is this with? And no, we're not, we're not with the government we're like a private organization it's like well you're a private organization what do you gain from this <laughs> yeah it's like like why would you do this i don't understand why would you help me yeah the idea of altruism was so foreign that it was like there's something up or i don't deserve this yeah it's like i, I can't even imagine what do you have to gain because that was the question i'd always ask what does this person have to gain from me by helping me and I, that was what i asked for weeks while i was doing the application process i kept asking myself what do you have to gain and it was a while before I could really believe that, oh, they're just good people and they just want to help. So Jordan and Devin graduated high school and got accepted into the University of Memphis. They moved down to Memphis where Youth Villages continued to work with them while they were in school. I told you when I got into college, I wasn't even a functioning adult, right? So it's like I would, when, I, when I say that, I mean, I could not have done this right here. Like even being out and about in public around wow, a group so of so long ago, but there was a time when Jordan could not stand a crowd larger than three people. If there were more than three strangers in front of him, he wanted to leave immediately. Yeah, I would just freak out. I would just lock down. I couldn't speak. I couldn't go into parks or movie theaters or restaurants because the anxiety of it was so much that I just couldn't even function. But while they were in college, a youth village specialist gave them an assignment to write a vision statement about their ideal vision of themselves. A program consultant advised that I do a vision statement. And it took me a long time to do it because I thought it was brutal. It was hard to be honest about some of those things with myself. It was hard to admit some of those things. Uh, but it once- was, Can you go back? It's hard, what was hard about it? It felt very lowly to admit just how desperate I was to have some things that I perceived would be simple to others, like being physically fit, working out at the gym, something like that. You know, saying, oh man, I've never been able to do that, to maintain physical fitness, to maintain proper dieting. I, I don't see myself working a real job. You know, I'm kind of scared of the job market. I'm kind of scared of trying to find what I want to do. It was embarrassing uh, because that's that idealized self that I've wanted to live my whole life and I hadn't been able to achieve it before. Going back to the um, the idealized vision, I want to say that when I was at my lowest in depression, it was a fantasy of what I wanted to be. And that fantasy was addicting because as a kid, you know, even, even in my teenage years, but not, I want to say even before my teenage years, I would fantasize of an adult me who was stable, who was healthy. And I mean, 
physically and mentally, who did no substance abuse, who did a good job, who was respected by his peers, who worked out regularly and took care of himself. That was a fantasy of mine. And I really, and when I say it was a fantasy, I mean, I did not believe that it could exist. I did not believe it could become real, but I wanted to dream of it anyway. And once I got into college, the further I pushed along, the more I looked at it and I was like, you know, I called it a fantasy when I was a kid, but I want to try for it anyway. I, I started going to the gym regularly. I said, hey, you know, I was told I'm supposed to get a major and a minor, but just because I want to be my ideal self, I want to get two majors, just because why not? I, I started trying to find a job for the first time. My first job was as a desk assistant, which, you know, everybody has to start somewhere. But the second job uh, that I had uh, was uh, working at Starbucks. I was the third one. Third job was Starbucks. And I worked as a barista. And I loved it because the experience of interacting with people and having the chance to develop my social skills to learn how I wanted to be perceived by others, to learn how to present myself to others, the, the image of myself that I wanted others to have of me too, I, I got to practice it and it was just fun. Uh, we want to talk about idealized self. I always, ever since I was seven, don't know why when <laughs> uh, I was seven. I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, uh, I think it's because I played a game called Neopets and they had like a little stock market simulator thing on there. And as soon as I learned about that, I was fascinated with the idea and always wanted to be involved in the stock market. And uh, about when I was in college, I started with $60. My first investment attempt was in Pandora. I lost $12 on Pandora <laughs> before I said, you know what, I think this company's not doing so great. And it was like a very <laughs> painful first three years of trying to learn how the stock market works. Things, uh, this is going to be some jargon, things like Theta, Delta, um, IV crush, options trading, calls, puts. Uh, it, it was something that um yv actually stretched out over us for a while because you know we had to admit hey where'd your money go and we're like oh we kind of lost it in the market <laughs> um but i i kept pursuing it because i'm sitting there you know i'm thinking part of my idealized self is i want to be a guy who wakes up every morning and the first thing i do as part of my morning routine is check the stock market don't know why I want to I want to have a little computer set up on a desk and I, I want to look at the market in the morning. That's just something I want to do. And he wants a portfolio and he wants to sit there and look at, yes, how's my portfolio doing this morning? That just feels like a respectable thing to do. And to our credit, you know, I the, have achieved some financial stability through the stock market. Yes, we actually, after years of slowly losing money, we, uh, the, the little GameStop fiasco that happened. I was in on that. Yeah, we were in on it. We are seeing a phenomenon that I have never seen. GameStop shares. There's nothing normal about what you're seeing when it comes to this stock right now. Certain stocks like GameStop have been soaring, fueled by amateur day traders. This GameStop situation is the craziest I think I've ever seen. That stock is skyrocketing higher in the OT. Video game retailer GameStop is set to continue their head-spinning ascent today. GameStop's stock is surging. The video game retailer has soared about 800% in the last week. Yeah, we were in on it back when everybody on that forum, it's called, you know, Wall Street Bets. Uh, people don't know this, but back in October of last year, everyone on that forum was calling people like us who were investing in GameStop every... They had a lot of negative fun words to you choose guys were from. In, the, in October? Yes. Yeah, in, in October. Yeah. Wow. Months before. So did you guys make like... We made a life-changing amount of money in the sense that we have a couple of years to figure out what we want to do with our lives. We didn't make the kind of money where we're going to sit here at the age of 23 and retire and just not care, but we made enough that we're not scared. You know, we're not coming out of college. We have time. Yeah, we're not coming out of college and like, oh my God, if I don't find a job in two weeks and, and start working 40 hours or whatever, then I'm just screwed. Now we, we have the time to figure out what we want to do and pursue it. We There are many people in our family that do not know how much money we made. We only told some people because they were still used to us being needing yeah, like, money. Our aunt came up to us one night and she was like, hey, I can pay the, I'm, I'm sorry y'all, I need the $50 for your share of the phone bill and, and I'll, I'm sorry, I can't pay it. I have some food stamps if you need food. And I got in the car and I'm like, I cannot pretend in front I of this woman this. that we don't have money. Like, it's like, it's like I'd be telling her, okay, we don't, I mean, I mean, I made money in GameStop. She's like, well, how much do you make? And I'm like, I mean, you know, maybe like, She's like, oh my God, Devin, did you really make <laughs> She broke down crying. <laughs> oh she, my she, God. Yes, yeah, she was actually sitting in the car crying because she was like, I'm so happy for you. I don't have to be scared anymore. I don't have to, because she was, she's, you know, 
the the rough background that we had, she's been scared the whole time that we were always going to need help. And so for yeah. us to for us to finally be financially stable and take care of ourselves is just a huge burden off of her. That, that she feels a huge burden off of her shoulders. And, you know, she's the kind of person, she doesn't want any of her money. Uh, she's actually had a couple of issues where she didn't have money. And I was like, hey, I mean, we have money. You helped us our entire childhood. Isn't it fair that we help you? And she is adamant she will never take one penny from us. She refuses. The stock market is one of my fascinations. I will never, ever, no matter what, I will not quit the stock market. No, he can't. I'm, I'm, I've just given up on it. I was like, ah, it's risky, but it's like, ah, who am I kidding? He's not... He'll die before he gives up on the stock market. <laughs> yeah, hey, it sounds like it's working out just fine for you. We're now going to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? It's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work, not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself, because you are your greatest asset. And special offer to Stronger Than You Think listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash S-T-Y-T. The initials of this show. That's betterhelp.com slash S-T-Y-T. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. Before we get back to the twins, we're going to talk to Becky Smith, who at the beginning of the episode mentioned the philosophy that behavior is more of a skill than a will, and that youth will do well if they can, if they are given the skills to do so. I think Jordan and Devin are a perfect example of that. So can you tell us a little bit more about how it's more of a skill than a will? So the official philosophy is collaborative problem solving, and it is evidence-based and effective. Individuals can look it up and try to, you know, implement some of that mentality. But I really, I would love to see school systems incorporate that. It's, you know, in New York, they do it. There's been a lot of positive outcomes from that. It does heal the brain of the trauma stuff too, which was one of the main reasons we looked at it. We want to be trauma informed at Youth Villages. And so it is a really good philosophy to have in trying to help heal the brain of trauma impacts. And, you know, poverty is a form of trauma, being raised in that kind of environment. And it definitely could be its own podcast, the impacts of poverty on, on a person. And that they don't choose to be, you know, kids especially. We can't choose our family. We are stuck with the ones we were born into. And so now if you're born into a family that is, you know, in poverty, like, like the outcomes of kids who are raised in poverty aren't great. And super sad because they didn't have any choice in that. But the twins prove it doesn't have to be your future. You can make choices. And I think that's important too. I think, especially in our world, the choices we make matter. And it doesn't matter where we come from. We can always choose different. And so I really love that about their story, especially that, yeah, they had a lot of what we would consider risk factors. You know, the, the ACEs is a study of adverse childhood experiences, which the more that you have as an individual in early childhood, the less likely you are to be successful, the more likely you are to have medical issues and diseases medically. But look what they've done. Look what they have proven. It doesn't have to be their future and your future if you come from a similar situation. They didn't know what was available. They didn't know what was out there and how good life really could be because of their experience. And I feel like that happens a whole lot with our kids. They have no idea 
that even what their experience is trauma, is abuse, is not typical or normal or healthy because it's all they know. So we have to expose kids to a better life, the potential for a better life, but the work that it takes. Like you can't just will a better life, you have to work for a better life, uh, which again was one of the things I was really impressed with the twins that they're not sitting back waiting for the better life to come to them. They're working and they're putting things in place. What you come from does not define who you are or define who you have to be in the future, that your goals can be attainable, reachable. You just have to work at it. Maybe you need the supports to help you figure it out. You know, we were not created to be without relationships, without connections, that we are created for connection and relationships. So I think naturally we desire for support systems. And so it just makes sense to me that they were able to do so much because of the supports that surrounded them. When it comes to visualizing your ideal self, do you have any advice to listeners who might want to try that out? Well, I actually had a conversation this morning because that was on my mind from listening to the twins talk about it. I do supervision for people getting their license. And so one of the conversations that I was having with this particular person was their ultimate goals. Like, what do they want to see? And they kept saying, well, I don't know if I can do that, though. I don't know if I can do that. I'm like, well, we're going to dream big. We're going to have goals and not limit ourselves. And then you have to take it step by step. When we think about the ideal self, it could be overwhelming to people. So you have to break it down. Like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And so it's the same thing, step by step, break it into easier, attainable goals. People need to feel successful Mm -hmm. in things that they do. And if they don't experience success to some degree along the way, they will give up. It's easy to give up because you get frustrated, like this isn't attainable. So let's back it up a little bit. What do we need to do, the steps to get there? Because if you ask the twins back in the day of, I know if foster care was not a great experience for them, but if you would have asked them even prior to that, if they ever could have imagined them being where they are now, they would probably tell you no. There's no way I would have imagined myself where I am right now when I was 13, 12, because they're stronger than they think. You know, they, you just do. Like for most of us, it's, there's not an option to give up, to quit. Um, and for those who feel like it, that's the actual. You got to reach out to people that you know are struggling and not doing well in this life because it is a tough life. It's not always easy. And so we have to come up outside of ourselves and be that person for other people. At this point, Jordan and Devin are seniors at the University of Memphis. How would you introduce this concept of visualizing your ideal self to someone who's completely unfamiliar with the exercise? I I have a question for these people. You know, if you can't envision yourself, you you know, you say it's a foreign concept, envisioning your ideal self, I would ask them, who's your favorite role model? Who do you look up to? Do you have any kind of famous hero, you know, any figure, they don't action star? They they don't have to be realistic. They don't have to be a figure. I mean, they can be completely grounded in fiction. They can be... As is a literary term, a Mary Sue, it doesn't matter. It can be Batman. It doesn't matter. You know, who? What? who's your favorite figure? Why do you idolize them? What do you love about them? What parts of them do you see in them that you wish you could be? And I'm, obviously, I'm not suggesting literally try to be Batman, you know. But, but it's more like the, the aspects of their character itself, like their personality or pieces. What are the traits of Batman that, you know, for somebody who likes Batman, what are the traits of Batman that make you enjoy him as a character so much? Like a lot of, I would say, the basis of what kind of person I wanted to be would go from purely fictional characters. I didn't have any real good uh, in-person role models. All of my decisions about what kind of person I wanted to be, all of them were grounded in fiction. And, you know, in my video games, I was always playing the heroes in my games. So, you know, whatever kind of person I wanted to be, I wanted to be a good person. I wanted to be someone who helps people because that that's that's a good person to be. And that's where I started. Right now, I'm 23 and I'm closer to my idealized self than I've ever been. But I'm not there yet. I still want to keep working over the next few years to further my fitness. Uh, I want to be very lean, very athletic 
very capable. I always want to feel capable, but I also want to be very financially stable in the sense that I never have to worry about money again. In the sense that I'm respected by my peers, you know, when other people look to me, they look at me and they think to themselves, that's somebody I can depend on. This person is reliable. This person knows what they're doing. They're confident. And if you've got a problem, even if this person doesn't have the solution to it right away, he can figure the solution out. For my part, um, a lot of my, I want to say the fantasy for me, uh, relies heavily on wealth altruism and I guess leadership within some kind of movement or an idea I would very much like to be a strong debater I would like to be a strong thinker and in some way advance the way that we as a society move you know I will always say no system's perfect but there's always room for improvement and if I can find any way to improve the system and be a part of implementing that that would satisfy me for my life what are you guys excited about right now? I am excited to graduate college. I'm ready to fight for a job that I want. Not something to satisfy me and say, well, this will pay the bills. Because I can see a future in front of me that requires hard work, but it's exciting. Because it means I finally get out there and I get to start making my own mark on life. I'm excited just to kind of leave the more guided setting that we've experienced so far you know we did pursue higher education um we've been helped by yv for these past what five and a half years now and here when we finally get into our own home uh you know have our car we're pursuing our own careers it'll it'll be completely on us and i i, I want to see how we do it's less predictable you know it's more of what's tomorrow's gonna bring I feel like we're entering another stage of our lives, and I believe the odds are kind of in our favor here, and I want to see what oh, that yeah. brings. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, living expenses taken care of for the next year, you know, solid connections, solid uh, living conditions. Oh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit in our favor. <laughs> Thank you, Ivy. <laughs> Lastly, what would you tell someone who is where you were in poverty, suffering from depression and anxiety? I would say that I know it's hard, I know it sucks, but there's a better future out there. And even if it's really hard to see right now, you've got to keep fighting for it. You have got to keep pushing. I would say um, that I, especially if you're depressed, I understand, right, the desire to give up. I really do. I totally understand. And we sympathize with it. We sympathize with that desire to give up. I understand that feeling of being in the abyss, of it being hard to move, like your body feels like lead some days. It's hard to do the dishes, it's hard to take out the trash, it's hard to take a shower. Believe me, I promise, I know. If you can't find a way to help yourself, then try to find someone else who can support you. Anyone, anyone who you think can be a link, anyone who you think can help build you up. Financial support, emotional support, a therapist, it does not matter. Find somebody who can help you start to make a change in your life. I am living proof that they can take someone from a very poor uh, background with a family that I might describe as a history of failure and turn them into someone who can actually pursue, say, that middle class life. If they can make us into successful adults, they can make anybody into a successful adult. It doesn't feel like that. It really does. Um, they care. They try. They're serious. And I've always enjoyed working with YV. Um, and I seriously cannot imagine, I don't like to imagine how my life would be without them. I refuse to. It's, YV has been there, and I won't think of it any other way. From Youth Villages, I'd like to say thank you for listening to this episode of Stronger Than You Think. And thank you to Jordan and Devin for sharing your story with us. We're happy to report that since recording this episode, both Jordan and Devin graduated from the University of Memphis, and now they both actually work at Youth Villages. If you'd like to get involved, go to youthvillages.org. We have resources there where you can find out more information about our programs and how you can help. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, the best thing you can do is recommend it to a friend. Maybe share it with someone you think might need it right now. We'd also love to hear what you thought about today's episode, so leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Production support was provided by Parasar Studios in Memphis, Tennessee.
On behalf of Youth Villages, this is Alec Og reminding you that you are stronger than you think. Oh, I want to correct you right there. You said overstate their contributions. Um, I mean, you you said understate, but I think you meant overstate. Thank cool. you. Just say the word overstate. I'll plug it in. Overstate. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah.